Hey guys, welcome back. Well, guess what? I got an email the other day from APT saying they had a new release. I read about this new release. This is 1.88.6, and they have uh, what they're playing around with now as an alternate focusing method called the Fourier method, in which they take advantage of the Fourier transform to transform the entire image and come up with an assessment of how good focus is. And I wanted to kind of walk through some of the ideas behind it because it's a, it's a concept that's very familiar to me in my work in the area of vibration where Fourier transform is a, is a big player. And so I was intrigued when I read that that's what they were doing and I wanted to kind of uh, play around with it a little bit myself and, and formulate a few few thoughts on it that I wanted to share with you. A sine wave, as you might imagine it recorded in time, is in the time domain. And when you transform the sine wave, it goes into a spike at a particular frequency in the frequency domain. So in other words, a continuous wave becomes a spike in the uh, frequency or wave number domain. Now, if you take a spike in the time domain or space domain, then take the Fourier transform of that, you get a constant across all frequencies for a perfect spike. We don't have perfect spikes. We have something that looks like this. If we imagine our looking at our stars on edge here. So we have the background level of light in space here. We have a star that's in pretty poor focus and spread out. So the half flux diameter, for example, right there, that is a, a, a poor focus, a very large half flux diameter. We move into focus and now the half flux diameter comes up to here. And and then we get better focus and the half flux diameter comes up to here. So we, we know that when we reduce half flux diameter, we're getting to a, a better focus. And then the minimum half flux diameter is the optimum focus. So this is the idea uh, behind the Fourier transform method where these images or an image like this is, is thought of as uh, spikes or impulses. And we're interested in the impulse response in the frequency or in this case, the wave number domain. If we transform these three examples of a star image as looked at from the side, we get this in the wave number domain. And as you can see with this out of focus star, it doesn't cover as much out in wave number space uh, as the other stars. And as you improve focus, you get a further extent out into the wave number space. And finally, as you approach optimum focus, you're starting to max out in terms of the extent of the wave number space that you will be able to achieve with your focuser. And we've talked about this before, but there is a theoretical limit to the uh, width of the half flux diameter of a star based on the F number of your scope and the wavelength of light that you're imaging with. What I think the folks at APT are doing, they're taking the area under this curve, which is kind of proportional to the power in the image, the image power, and then they're taking the inverse of the power. So now as the inverse of the power goes down, focus is improving. And so that kind of correlates to as the half flux diameter decreases, focus improves. In other words, the star spreads out in wave number space. And that's sort of the basic idea behind this new method. Now, just to give us some data to play around with, let's go over to Pix Insight, where I have some images I took when I was playing around with focus in the, uh, in the more or less recent past. So I've got about 10 images here that I've loaded into Blink, and we're going to be taking a look at this star right here. And as I go through it, this you can see in the file names over here, this number over on the right is the focuser position. So as we march forward and focus here, you'll see what happens to these stars as we go. Starting here, you can see them tightening up to better focus, and then finally we start to get out of focus on the other side. I want to play around with this data using the inverse power method, and let's see how it compares to the half-flux diameter approach that we are familiar with. All right, so here's one of those images pretty close to focus that we were just looking at in Blink, and I'm going to concentrate on this particular star, and if I blow that up again, it looks like that. As I say, this is pretty close to focus. It may not be at the ideal focus position, but it's pretty close. And then I'm going to cut a cross-section through my image and pull out the light intensity as a function of pixel position across the width of the image, as I'm showing here. And of course, as you can see, we don't have any stars until we get to this one pixel where we finally do hit the star. And there's actually several pixels here that, that the star is spread out over. But you can see we get to a pixel where the star appears and then we're back down to a base level of of uh, sky brightness in the background. Now what I want to do is illustrate this Fourier method using a single row of this image and we'll just 
apply it to this particular star just to kind of get our heads wrapped around what this method is actually doing. And then we'll go through and look at uh, these images that we were just looking at in Blink, and we'll apply the inverse power method as implemented in the astrophotography tool to see how that's working as compared to our half-flux diameter approach. If I take these stars and now I zoom in uh, where that star is, you can see that there are, well, there's a good uh, six images here. Uh, this one here is very out of focus, and then there are a couple improving focus, a little better in focus, until we get up around this area where uh, we're approaching uh, optimum focus somewhere in this particular focus or position between 4700 and 4750, it appears. But now, if I apply the Fourier transform to each one of these star images, I get this. We are seeing the hint of what we were talking about with the theoretical uh, half sine pulses that we were just looking at a bit ago and you can certainly see that with this out of focus star it doesn't get very far out into the wave number domain whereas when you get up to this red star uh, this red the star with the red curve you can see that we are getting farther out into the wave number space and then it becomes a a, uh, a balance between are we better between the purplish curve or the red curve which is kind of the question you would ask if you were looking at these two it appears that the purple curve is going a little farther out in wave number space than the red curve. And of course, that's not really the metric that they're using in APT. I think they're calculating the area under these curves. The problem is there's quite a bit of noise in this wave number space. And, and the, the reason is I'm not compensating for the fact that one side of this image is uh, not equal to the other side of the image. Why would it be? It's two different parts of an image. Uh, the problem is, is that the, the Fourier transform assumes periodicity. So in other words, that's like saying the image we were just looking at has the same image just to the right of it and just to the left of it on out to infinity. That's a fundamental assumption in using the Fourier transform. So one way to get around that is by squeezing off the ends called applying a data window to uh, make the images appear more uh, periodic or at least equal. And here's what a data window looks like. In this case, it's called the Blackman-Harris window. There are other windows that look similar to this, but there is a, a functional form for this uh, particular window. And you can see what it does, that the ends of the image is gonna squeeze out the data till it's a zero magnitude, zero slope at one edge of the image and zero magnitude, zero slope at the other edge of the image so that when you apply the data window to your star profile, you get something that looks like this. Now, this kind of has the added advantage for astrophotography in that it concentrates the evaluation effort to the center of our image where the stars will tend to be more round and we're avoiding potential uh, image artifacts that can live up in the corners of our images. The whole purpose of the window is to make the image appear periodic. Let's look at the effect of applying a data window to our star data. So we had this with no window applied, and if we apply the data window that we're just talking about, we get something that looks like this. So it's quite a bit better. We eliminate quite a bit of noise if we apply a data window and make the image appear periodic. That's a little more in keeping with the concept behind the Fourier transform and why we use data windows and signal processing to reduce the noise. I don't know if, and the developers of this algorithm are including a data window, uh, but certainly if everything hinges on identifying the extent of a star, the Fourier transform of a, a star image, you certainly want to cut down as much noise as possible. Otherwise, that can affect your ability to discern when you have optimum focus. Now let's go over to astrophotography tool. What I've done is successively loaded each one of those images we were looking at in blink. So remember we went from out of focus to good focus and then back out of focus again. And I'm using the astrophotography tool that we're familiar with to calculate the half flux diameter of that star we've just been looking at in our example with the 1D for a transform. And so it's giving, it's taking a look at this star and giving me a half flux diameter of 1.09. But there's also now in focus craft, the inverse power method. And this gives us a number, it's kind of oddly presented. Frankly, they need to, to kind of work on this a little bit, but the number the way they present it is 15 vertical bar 1.6, which I believe is interpreted as 1.96 times 10 to the 15. I would suggest that you perform a focus run, take that first number you get for your inverse power and use that to normalize all the other numbers. And then that way you'll have a more manageable looking display and won't be as confusing. I'm gonna divide through their 
inverse power number as it represented like this by 10 to the 15th. So I get down to a more typical number that we're used to. And when I take that data from all of these 10 images and plot it, uh, this is what I get. Now I've got three things going on here. So we need to be careful and kind of step through this. The blue circles here are those images, but I've handed them off to ASTAP in order for it to calculate an image wide half flux diameter. And so you see the characteristic curve that we're all familiar with. It kind of looks like a hyperbola. All right, so that's pretty good data there. Then uh, the astrophotography tools half flux diameter as calculated for this one single star is plotted here and it looks similar. It's offset by some constant, that's okay. But there is this star here, that uh, this particular image here where that star was not properly evaluated. This is what we would use to fit a hyperbola. And by the way, a hyperbolic fit is extremely valuable for uh, smoothing over uh, these anomalous deviations like this that can occur because of seeing or some other effect. The red triangles are the ones we're kind of interested in here. Again, it has this uh, similar sort of characteristic in that it, when it's out of focus, it's high. Then it comes in as we approach focus, it becomes low and it goes back high again. So that's good. The problem is, is that it tends to be rather flat, at least in this example, uh, across the area where you are most interested in focus. Now, compare that to this curve here. One can easily imagine a nice hyperbolic curve fitting through here and nailing down the focus position as being somewhere back in here. Whereas if you fit a hyperbolic curve to this, and you can fit a hyperbolic curve to anything, if you have three data points, you can fit a hyperbolic curve to it. This doesn't look like it wants to be a hyperbolic curve it is sure going to be difficult to identify where critical focus is using this methodology. And I don't know if you were just taking the raw data, you'd say this point here was the focus position. Whereas if you were taking the raw data from the half flux diameter, it looks to me like you'd be a heck of a lot closer to the correct uh, focus or position than you would be if you use this inverse power uh, method. Okay, so let's just go over what we're seeing here. I think it's great to, that uh, astrophotography tool users and developers are working together to come up with new ideas. I love new ideas. And for any of you familiar with my channel, you know, I love new ideas about focusing. So I'm really, uh, this really caught my attention and, and why it is I had to put out a video before I've even tried using it. It's certainly an interesting uh, idea. There is some sound theoretical basis for it. So the method is based on transforming a whole image uh, into the Fourier domain, the frequency or wave number domain, and calculating the signal power. And the idea being that a an image that is in focus uh, has greater power, image power, signal power, than an image that's out of focus. So that's the whole idea. Now, one of the advantages that they speak of, if I'm understanding them correctly, is that uh, this method doesn't require a star detection algorithm. They don't care where the stars are. They just apply the 4D transform to it and calculate the power. And in they say that that uh, makes it a very fast algorithm. Now, I don't know about the computational benefits of this because the big time sink in focusing is the amount of time it takes to get an exposure, say 10 seconds of an exposure for, for a narrow band filter, plus the second or two it takes to move the focuser, plus the second or two you specify for the system to settle down after the focuser is activated. Then you do the computation, and the computation is the absolute smallest fraction of that. So I don't think there's any computational advantage uh, to this at all, and it's certainly not faster. In other words, you still need to move the focuser and get an image to have the method evaluate it. So you still, seems to me, you still have to go through the same number of steps in terms of collecting data for the focuser method to react to. Now, fair warning. It's time for jump to conclusions and get off my long guy. All right. I love focusing algorithms. I love new ideas, but not every new idea is a good idea. A couple of things I have uh, potential concerns about is that the wave number domain is susceptible to confusion. For example, a hot pixel is like an ideal impulse. It's, uh, it's a very bright, very localized light source that will generate a very high wave number content. And if you guys use SCTs, you have a center obstruction. And as you go out of focus, your stars don't look like cotton ball. They look like a donut. So that edge of a donut on one side and the edge of the donut on the other side will serve to also create high frequency content or high wave number content. And this whole method is predicated on the idea that high wave number content speaks to 
the quality of focus, and those are two examples that may undercut that. The inverse power metric appears to be flatter than a half-flux diameter curve, which I think is going to make it difficult to extract the optimum focus position from and whatever curve fit, if there is a curve fit, uh, that they're using. So it's not clear to me that it's it's easier to identify f- optimum focus. Let's face it, uh, the half-flux diameter and hyperbola work fine. I'll be looking forward to hearing about the APT uh, user experience with this algorithm. It may be that my initial jump to conclusions, get off my lawn attitude is not well suited for this first evaluation. What is the next step in focusing? I think it's that we have to get away from this idea that every time we do a focus, it's as if we we don't have any idea where focus is. What we do, even though focus changes very, to very small levels during the course of an imaging session, every time we run a, an auto-focusing step, we go way out of focus on one side, pass through focus into way out of focus on the other side, and then fit the curve and find the optimum focus that was actually just a tiny little turn of the focuser from where we were originally. To me, an imaging sh- session has the information available to make incremental steps transparent to the user. For instance, it knows the aperture, it knows the uh, focal ratio, the wavelength of light, it knows the temperature, it knows previous focuser positions were. It should be possible to take that information over the course of an imaging session and make little uh, focuser improvements along the way rather than having for us to stop down in the middle of a imaging session and do this big focusing run as if we don't know where focus is. I thought it was interesting to take a look at this new method being proposed by APT and being implemented really in this in the current version of APT. So while I'm happy that the folks at APT are, are exploring new ideas, let's not forget that we have some pretty good ideas already implemented, and maybe it's better to focus our time improving those ideas. We'll see. I'll be looking very much forward to hearing what you guys think about your experience with this new focusing method. Talk to you guys later.